Savannah, Georgia, often called by many as the most haunted city in the USA, has more paranormal hot spots than any other city on the eastern coast. We're going to look in depth at some of them. The Moon River Brewing Company. It has been called the most haunted place in Savannah. The structure was built as the City Hotel in 1821 by Eliezer Early, a native of Charleston, South Carolina. It was not only Savannah's first hotel, but it also housed the city's first branch of the United States Post Office. It also served as a bank of the United States branch. Peter Wiltberger purchased the City Hotel in 1851. To draw attention to his company, he remodeled it and put two real lions on display. The structure was utilized as a timber and coal warehouse at the turn of the century. As the use of coal declined, the structure was converted to general storage. The space was restored as an office supply store in the 1960s. After the store closed, the property was vacant until 1995, when it was refurbished and converted into a brew bar known as the Oglethorpe Brewing Company. Then in 1999, the Moon River Brewing Company took over the location. The basement of the brewing company holds a lot of interest. This is where the most well-known ghost resides. Toby is the name given to this ghost by the employees. He's in the basement which is open to the public. He prefers to walk through the lower level shadowy areas. One tour participant said that her body became chilly instantaneously. The frigid part of her body however, was just on the right side. The woman also said that she could hear voices but couldn't understand what they were saying. She was so upset she had to be taken outside. Other people who have went into the basement have described having the same uneasy feelings. There have been several reports of ghosts and shadows on the building's upper levels. There's the lady in white, people being pushed down the stairwell, people being forced out, and all types of strange things happening. The company's fourth floor appears to have a dark energy. The upper level was reportedly utilized as a temporary hospital, with many people dying of yellow fever in the outbreak of 1876. If you walk on this floor, you will sense this energy. Many people believe that the ghosts seen on this floor are those who died from yellow fever. The experience is based on how they died and suffered before their deaths. On the second floor, a well-known shooting occurred. James Shark and Philip Minas were involved in this shooting. Philip, a local physician, was the one who shot James. It is rumored that James Stark can still be found wandering the hallways of the brewery. He's been seen on both the main floor and the second story. There have been numerous incidents that can only be defined as paranormal. Otherwise, there is no logical explanation. At the brewery, ghosts are causing havoc. Although the brewery has a great dining room, there is some unusual activity there. According to one gentleman, he was on a date when his lady companion excused herself to use the restroom. She didn't come back for another 15 minutes. She was crying and shaking when she returned. She claimed that she couldn't get out of the bathroom because the door wouldn't open. The stall was locked, and she couldn't unlock it even with all her strength. She'd scream for assistance and beg to be let out and pushed one final time, and it finally opened. Located at 23 Abercorn Street in Savannah, the construction of James Habersham Jr.'s mansion began in 1771, but it was not completed until 1789. Habersham was one of the richest men in the colonies, during the Revolutionary War the British occupied his residence, they were uninvited occupants but he had no choice in the matter, so the construction of the mansion was halted. Red bricks were used for the primary structure, which was then covered over with white plaster. The red bricks would bleed through the plaster, turning the mansion pink. Maybe the quality of the bricks or the plaster job itself wasn't very good, but the red bricks would bleed through the plaster. The mansion was painted white again, but the bricks kept bleeding through. The house survived the Savannah Fire of 1796 that destroyed 229 buildings. After discovering his wife cheating on him, James committed suicide in the cellar of the pink house. The family hid the truth. According to the story, this was done so James could be buried alongside the rest of his family on church grounds. After the family sold it, it was owned by a number of people and survived the Great Fire of 1820, the War of 1812, 
and the Civil War, the house then sat vacant for 40 years. Throughout the years, everyone who had lived there had attempted, but failed, to repaint the mansion white. Finally, in the 1920s, a woman who owned the mansion decided to go with it, and painted it a shade of pink, which worked well for her tea parlor. The mansion has been pink ever since then. The house was purchased for $60,000 in 1970 by partners Herschel McCallar Jr. and Jeffrey Keith who spent a year restoring the house. They opened the restaurant in 1971, and many of the original items are still present today. They sold the house to the Baelish's family in 1992, who continued to restore it. The old pink house is now owned by Donna Mokel's daughter. The pink bar, a great ballroom on the back of the building, as well as the grand ballroom, were added in 2008, increasing the total square footage to 17,000 square feet and having 13 dining rooms. It is considered one of the finer restaurants in Savannah. It also has a history of spirits and hauntings. Every employee who works at the estate has seen the apparition of James Habersham Jr. during the months of October to March, especially on peaceful Sunday afternoons. After work one day, a local man went by the basement pub for a beer. He noticed a gentleman sitting at the end of the bar with a drink in his hand, dressed in a revolutionary era costume. He caught the gentleman's eye, smiled, and raised his beer in a toast, thinking it was a man paid to give some atmosphere for the pub. The gentleman smiled and drank his drink in the same manner. The local citizen, taking his gaze away from the man for a second, commented to the bartender on the gentleman's outfit. The bartender replied, what man, and seemed confused, the gentleman he had seen, vanished into thin air. Once a waiter turned his back for a moment, after finishing his closing responsibilities by extinguishing all of the table candles for the evening. When he returned, an invisible presence had immediately relit all of the candles on all of the tables. The apparition of James Habersham's grandson, approximately 60 years old, has been known to materialize in solid form, order and pay for a beer at the basement bar, which used to be his bedroom. Because his own family's lot was filled, he walks to the local cemetery and vanishes into the Button family monument, where he is buried. A pianist for the basement piano bar, once noticed children running about the basement area out of the corner of her eye. In the hallway near the bathrooms, these children like throwing dice against the wall. These youths used to take wine bottles from behind the bar, and slam them against the bartender. The wine bottles are now stored in a glass enclosed refrigerator to keep this from happening. These children enjoy playing practical jokes on the living. One entity had a penchant for locking women in bathrooms. The management eventually removed the lock from the door, which helped the situation slightly, although a force is occasionally used to hold the door shut for a little while, trapping the frustrated customer inside. After a delicious meal, one guest stated, we got up to go and began climbing the steep steps to the first floor entry hallway. My right shoelace pulled itself out of the bow about three steps up the stairwell, wrapped itself around the edge of the step, and stuck there by itself. I was stopped in my tracks by this weird occurrence, and I felt beneath the step and found no nail or crack that might explain it, but I did find the end of my shoelace being held against the wood by a cold pressure, that dissipated when I pulled the end of the shoelace off the wood. Wright Square, is in the heart of Savannah's historic downtown district, next to the Federal Building and the Courthouse. Percival Square was originally named after Lord Percival but it wasn't until 1763 that it was renamed Wright Square in honor of James Wright, the last of Georgia's three governors. It would later be the resting place of Native American Chief Tomikichi, who assisted General James Oglethorpe in settling the area, and reaching an agreement with the surrounding tribes. When Tomikichi died, he was buried in the square in a traditional pyramid fashion from locally obtained stones, as a sign of gratitude for everything that he had done to establish this crucial strategic city. Wright Square was also the site of the infamous local hanging of Alice Riley. Alice Riley and her husband Richard White were two Irish servants, who embarked on a voyage from Great Britain with 33 others, in the hopes of finding a better life in the new world of America. They had little rights as servants, until the time of their service contract with whoever had funded their passage to the new world was completed. Unfortunately for Alice Riley and Richard White, 
Their contract had been funded by William Wise, who ran a cattle farm near Savannah, and frequently overworked his servants, and requested that their duty extend beyond their contractual obligations. The official explanation of the crime was that White strangled Weiss with a scarf to render him unconscious, and then he and Riley finished the job by submerging his head in a bucket of water, relishing their vengeance for a year of torture at the hands of their employer. All of the servants were toiling away when the body was discovered, except Riley and White, who had fled the cattle farm. Despite their claims of innocence, this was one of the key pieces of evidence used against them. The argument was that if they were innocent, they would not have fled the crime scene unless they were attempting to escape justice. Riley and White were both found guilty of the crime, and sentenced to draw their last breath at the end of a hangman's noose for the first murder in Savannah's history. Even if they were innocent, the prevailing rationale at the time was that a message must be given to keep all other servants in line, so as not to disturb the natural order of things. Riley was discovered to be pregnant shortly after her incarceration, and many suspected that the child belonged to the recently departed Weiss, who was known for ravishing his female workers, and Riley in particular had drawn his craven attention. Riley's death was postponed until after the delivery of the infant. The baby was taken from her arms immediately after her difficult childbirth, in an effort to appeal to the colony's Christian principles. Riley was the first to go to the gallows, and she maintained her innocence until the very last moment. She was forcibly walked up the gallows that had been erected next to what is now Wright Square, in front of the town's residence. Her lifeless body was left to dangle in the breeze for three days, as crows pecked away at her bloodshot eyes first, then her pallid skin. Her body was buried near the gallows where she met her end. Her spouse would stave off the same destiny for a time by staging a daring escape, but he was apprehended after a brief period on the run, and would meet the same death as Riley. There have been numerous reports of sightings of a ghostly apparition, of a mother searching for her child in and around Wright Square over the years. Alice Riley's final wish was to see her newborn child one last time before being led away to the gallows. Some people said they felt a chill run down their spine and out through their entire body. Others have said that when they felt a presence around them, the hair on their arms and neck rose straight up, while others have experienced a fast shift in temperature, in the region immediately surrounding the otherworldly presence. Alice is by far not the only spirit that has been encountered there, many people visiting the square have said they feel a presence and a feeling of being watched or followed, even when no one is around. The Kehoe House was constructed in May of 1892 on Columbia Square, in Savannah, Georgia. It was built for William Kehoe and his family of 10 children, two who have been reported to have died in the house. Kehoe was an ambitious Irishman who became one of Savannah's most notable businessmen. After making a fortune in iron, Kehoe spent $25,000 on the house's construction, which included making it a true exhibition of his iron profession. Iron was used for a lot of the detail trim, such as window casings and elegant columns. The house is listed on the National Registry of Historic Places. When the Kehoes died, and the house was passed down to the remaining children. They sold the house in 1930, and it was converted into a school. Years later the house was sold and used as a mortuary, and it became a private residence after that. Joe Namath, a football player with the New York Jets purchased Kehoe House for $80,000 in 1980. Joe considered turning Kehoe House into a nightclub and disco for a while, much to the dismay of his Columbia Square neighbors. He changed his mind, but kept the house and renovated it until 1989, when he sold it for $530,000. Any Kehoe spirit enjoys visiting the rooms 201 and 203. In room 203, a friendly feminine presence has been seen sitting on the bed next to sleeping guests. Annie's spirit has also been spotted sitting at the desk in the room writing. In room 201 guests have commented on the intense rose aroma. Annie's apparition has been spotted in this room going about her business. Around bedtime, Annie makes her rounds on the third level. This entity tenderly and lovingly kissed a past owner on the cheek as he slept in his bed in one of the guest rooms on this floor for the night. Also in room 201, a woman and her husband were sleeping in the same bed, when little hands gently stroked her hair and cheek, lulling her to sleep. She saw an apparition of a little boy, eye to eye and up close, 
who suddenly vanished. Guests and staff have heard the sound of small feet racing up and down the home's hallways. Even when no children were around, children's voices could be heard. We even got to experience the spirits of the children on the night of a full moon, one visitor wrote on TripAdvisor's reviews website. In the second floor hallway, we heard them running and playing. An inexplicable light is occasionally spotted in this empty room during the dark hours, far away from the busy guests. William's spirit is still savoring the peace and calm. William Kehoe pays a visit, sometimes through the front door. Once when the doorbell rang, the concierge was sitting at the check-in counter. She ignored the doorbell three times, because she could see no one standing there through the exquisite cut door glass. Not only did the entrance door unlock and open by itself, but all of the outside doors on all floors of the house did as well. Visitors who bring toys have seen the toys move, and the children's voices can also be heard throughout the night, lights will flicker on and off, and footsteps can be heard. The house at 432 Abercorn was built in 1868, however the area had previously been used as a burial ground. Calhoun Square, located just across the street, is also a hotspot for strange activity and is part of Savannah's haunted past. The house was built for Benjamin Wilson a wealthy man in the area, who was a partner in the Okufus Cotton Manufacturing Company. At the time it was one of the most expensive houses built in Savannah. Mr. Wilson's wife died shortly after the family moved into their new home, one of Yellow Fever's numerous victims. Mr. Wilson reportedly plunged into a heavy depression, but tried to pull himself together because he was now the sole parent of his children. Mr. Wilson was thought to be a bitter man, hardened by war, and bereft following the death of his wife. Some argue that he did the best he could given the circumstances, while others argue that he was excessively severe and controlling with his children. He had two daughters and four more children from a second marriage. And he vented his rage on them. Especially his eldest child, he would punish her by depriving her of food, and confining her to an empty room. He punished his daughter by tying her to a chair in the living room in front of the window, where she could only watch the other kids in the square play. The small child died of heat stroke and dehydration, after a few days of sitting like this in the window in the severe heat of a savannah summer. He was devastated when he realized his tragic mistake. The crime was not punished. Wilson had grown too powerful in savannah for the authorities to arrest him. The crime went unnoticed for a long time. Wilson, on the other hand, was not pardoned. His daughter's ghost was still seeking vengeance. In his sleep, she tormented and haunted her father. The ghost followed him about the house, frequently appearing in the room where she died on the second floor. She was determined on driving her father insane. He did not contrary to popular belief, commit suicide as was reported, but rather died of natural causes. There is also a rumor of a murder taking place there in the 1950s, but I won't go into detail since the story cannot be verified. The property was briefly rented out in the 1990s, when a large number of college students, from Savannah College of Art and Design lived there. They heard hammering, furious pacing, crying, and a lot of chuckling. Also one of the students staying there disappeared. A neighborhood resident who claims she can't go past the house because it emits such a terrible energy. One of her friends resided at the house for a while, but he mysteriously vanished while there, leading to wonder if his absence is connected to the paranormal activity at the property. The house at 432 Abercorn is a private residence now, yet it attracts a large number of tourists, and ghost seekers hoping to see anything extraordinary. It has been said the owners are considering converting it into a bed and breakfast. So what do you think of these stories? Do you have any to share? Let us know in the comments below, and as always please like and subscribe.